Good afternoon, friends. Stephen Benu with Israeli News Live. And uh, listen, tonight we're going to be going into a message. Uh, I, I, and I, listen, I know a lot of you guys that love to come here for the news, and I am definitely going to be doing some updates on news here. I cannot get away from some teachings, though, because I keep stumbling on things that are just absolutely mind-blowing. And uh, we're going to be looking at well, you remember where Jesus talks about the little lad that he brings up? They want to know who's going to be the greatest one in the kingdom, and his apostles do. And he takes a little lad, and he says, you know, basically sums it up with, you know, whoever offends the least of these, my little ones, it'd be better if a millstone were tied at his neck and he is cast to the bottom of the sea. You ever wonder who the lad was? Hmm, well, we may have the answer for you. It's actually speaking of one particular individual. Not only that, we're going to find out who those little lads are. In the uh, Egyptian writings, they talk about the blessed little ones. It's actually one and the same, by the way. And... Uh, I think you're going to find this very fascinating, uh, to say the very least there. Uh, before we get started in those, let me just, a couple things I want to share with you. Uh, I happened to run across this photo right here. I did not even know I still had this thing here. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys recognize, well, you probably don't recognize either one of these guys, right? Well, the guy there on, well, looking at my right, I guess in the picture it's on the left. I don't know how you guys see it on the screen there. That's Dr. Rami Arav. He is the uh, uh, head university professor of Nebraska, also was the uh, over the Bethesda Project. And uh, that was actually Nebraska University. And that happens to be me there about 12 years ago without a beard. And uh, I was there with Dr. Araf and honored to be able to, uh, to sit with all the professors. They asked me to sit with them at the time from the work that I had been doing on uh, Hebrew studies and things like that. Although it was archaeologists, I was not an archaeologist, neither a professor. But the professors there asked me to join them uh, while the, uh, the college uh, students sat separately, but they asked me to come up and sit with the professors as the lectures were going on. Uh, that was really, really interesting. And I, that was uh, kind, of, kind of an awkward feeling, but, you know, but yet at the same time, very honored for that. But I ran across that picture there. I was actually looking, uh, trying to get a message out to uh, Professor Rachel Elori on the Dead Sea Scrolls because of her work there and the Isaiah Scrolls and the different Isaiah Scrolls. So I was reaching out to uh, uh, Professor Elori and I uh, happened to run across on the internet this particular picture there with myself and Dr. Rami Arab there. So I figured I'd just share that with you. Another thing I want to share with you real quick though, uh, before we get started on this message here, and I know, you know, every once in a while some people put out some really goofy statements about LifeWave here. But uh, we are doing at 9 o'clock Eastern tonight a Zoom meeting uh, going into the science behind this. And, uh, you know, listen, this product, it is truly newsworthy. This should actually be on the news is what it should be. Uh, a very dear friend of mine who had 70% blocked carotid arteries uh, I knew about this. He was going in to have the surgery done, and they had to stop because they found out he had to have life-saving uh, open-heart surgery first. Did that. It's a long battle afterwards, but finally he just went back in the other day to go have the carotid arteries dealt with. And uh, he had been on the patches there, not too, too long, but had been on them uh, already, had started them, and uh, they're known to help your body to deal with uh, artery issues. And the doctors found out that he didn't need surgery. He said, your arteries are not blocked. They were blown away, want to know what the heck he had done. So we, the, the, the amazing testimonies are just absolutely ast astonishing. My aunt, who has dementia, uh, she's been on it now for a couple of weeks, and already her cognitive ability has totally turned around. So 
before you criticize or judge, you really need to take a serious look at what's going on. And you could join us tonight on the Zoom call. It'll be in the description of this video here. Uh, also, I'll post it over on Israeli News Live on Facebook. If you don't see it here, I'll post a link there for you so you could easily go find it that way. Uh, or email us, binunx 39 at gmail.com. Uh, but it is truly, truly uh, amazing uh, product. And my wife, my daughter now uh, as well, totally transformed, uh, you know, helping them. Both of them suffered migraines. Neither one of them have migraines any longer. Uh, it, it's just absolutely astonishing. And that's just in my own personal experience. And, and of course, we've got a lot of friends that have already been using the products as well. And again, uh, just amazing testimony. Um, listen, uh, let's go back here though. This <clears throat> is going to really stir you what you're about to find out here. I want to start with Matthew, and I'm using the Hebrew Matthew for a specific reason here. Uh, I do have King James as well up uh, on the computer, but I want to take you first, Matthew chapter 10. Jesus says, then Jesus called his 12 disciples and gave them power over every unclean spirit to cast, uh, to ca excuse me, every unclean spirit to cast them out from man to heal every sickness, every plague. These are the names of the 12 apostles called Apostolos, Simon, uh, called Petros and Andre, his brother, Philippos and uh, Bartholomeos and James and called Jimmy and John, his brother, sons of Zebedee, uh, Thomas and Matthew, that is Matteo, who by reputation was a lender of money for interest. <clears throat> James Alafue uh, and Tyrios, uh, Simon the Canaanite, that is Simeon the Canios and Judah Iscariota, who after uh, this betrayed him. All right. Now, by the way, they use a lot of the Greek verbiages in here uh, when he's saying it. Um, or maybe Latin. I, I don't know which one that would actually be. But anyway, <clears throat> notice though, Jesus called his 12 disciples. He gave them power. Now, if you remember when they went out, he sends them abroad. He tells them not to go into the, to, to the lands of the Gentiles and do not enter in the, the, the cities of the Samaritans. But go only to the sheep who have strayed from the house of Israel. There again, that goes back to the fact that we know, according to Acts chapter 2, verse 36, that the house of Israel had already come home. So those that think that there are ten lost tribes, no, they were not. They heard the gospel. They did come back. And on the day of Pentecost, they were there, according to the writing of the book of Acts. Jesus clearly sends out his apostles, all 12 of them, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It's recorded in the scripture. You can't get away from it, right? But that's what, not what we're here to talk about. This is going to go into something that's going to totally make your mind go like, what? Uh, it's one of those, are you serious type moments, really? Okay, now, let's back up here. Um, let me look over here what I have. This is Matthew chapter 18, King James. Let me read to you here. And whosoever shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. But who shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, if it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck? that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from you. It is better for you to enter into the halter main rather than having two hands or two feet be cast into everlasting fire. Now, how many times have you wondered, like even like verse 7, Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. He's talking about a little lad, and yet he's getting into all these other things here, and you can't help but wonder, what in the world is all this about? Who's the man? Who is that man that the offense is going to come by? Who's the little lad that, got, that if you offend him, 
It would be better off that you had a millstone hung around your neck and who's the guy that actually does the offending? Let's back up. The same time came the disciples unto Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? That's when Jesus calls the little child in him and set him in the midst of them. And he said, Verily I say unto you, Except you be converted and become as a little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. The child that was sitting there, friends, was only for an analogy, only for a to show something there. You're about to discover what it's all about. Let's back up over. We're going to go to the Hebrew, Matthew. And at that time, the disciples drew near to Jesus and said unto him, Do you think, uh, who, whom do you think is great in the kingdom of heaven? Make it a little bit bigger. I'll make sure you can see it real well. He called a small lad and placed him in their midst. And he said, I say, if you do not turn to become like this lad, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. He who receives a lad like this in my name receives me. He who causes one of the small lads who believe on me to stumble, it would be good for him to tie a millstone upon his neck and be cast into the depth of the sea. Now, if you'll notice in the Hebrew, Matthew uses the word stumble rather than offend. I do believe that stumble would be more accurate, especially when you find out who this is talking about. Woe to the inhabitants of the world because of confusion, because confusion must come. He also said, woe to the man who comes because of it. I, you can't help but wonder when you're going from the lad to this point here, what do they have in common? If you know who the lad is and who the lad represents, then the rest of it will make sense to you. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off, cast it from you, it is better for you to enter the life blind or lame than having two hands or two feet for you to be given to everlasting fire. If your eyes should cause you to stumble, you know, pick it out, cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than two eyes to be given to Gehenna. Take heed lest you judge one of the small lads. I say to you, their angels always see the sons of my Father who is in heaven. Again, you go from that extreme back to that little lad and he says to you, take heed lest you judge one of my small lads. I say to you, their angels always see the sons of my father who is in heaven. Now it's in the plural. It started off with a singular, a lad, now it's lads in the plural. And the Son of Man has stopped saving the enemy. What is your opinion? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them runs off, will he not leave the ninety and nine in the mountains and go and seek the one who has strayed? All right, let me, let me take you back over here to Luke. I scrolled up already there. Uh, what I want to show you here, if you notice, uh, as we were looking just a moment ago, verse 20, notwithstanding, see, they said, behold, I given, he said, behold, I given you power to tread on serpents and scorpions over all power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not the spirits are subject in you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. All right. Your names are written in heaven. Now, that was the 70, along with the 12 disciples that went out. Okay? So, and when you look at that, that's exactly what we see. that the, the, they, they all go out, but their names are written in heaven. Now, you might wonder, how does this all go together? I want, I want to share with you, right? Because, see, in the book of Revelation... 
we have here. And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within, and on the back side sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book, to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book, to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, and in the midst of the throne, and the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, and which were the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having one, every one of them harps of golden vials full of odors, which are full of the prayers of the saints. They sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. And thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Okay? Now, I, I don't want to go into a whole lot of, 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 the, of Revelation here because the whole point is, is that there, the book that's in heaven is loosed, it creates a reigning upon the earth of kings and priests. And it was a book that was sealed that only Christ could reveal. Well, you might think, gosh, what's that got to do with what you read over here about the little lad in Matthew? Well, let's take a look. And again, what I'm going to show you now is from one of the Egyptian writings here. And I only look at this in a historical context not a biblical context, but look at what is written here. After all these, there came the little children also, those to whom the knowledge of the Father belongs. Having been strengthened, they learned about the impressions of the Father. They knew they were known. They were glorified. They glorified. There was manifest in their heart the living book of the living, the one written in the thought and the mind of the Father, which from before the foundation of the totality was in his incomprehensibility. That book no one was able to take, since it remains for the one who will take it to be slain. No one could have become manifest from among those who have believed in salvation unless that book had appeared. For this reason, the merciful one, the faithful one, Jesus was patient in accepting suffering until he took that book since he knows that his death is life for many. The little children also to whom the knowledge of the Father belongs... That mystery that was written in that book belongs to the little ones. But Christ had to come and open that book. He had to reveal that book. And also we find that according to Luke's gospel, Jesus said to them, Don't rejoice that the spirits are subject to you, but rather that your names are written in heaven, written in that very book. Now, Again, you might say, though, what has that got to do with over here and, and about these lads there, right? Okay, I'll show you. The lad represents one of the little ones is what it does. Let's back up and look at it again. At that time, the disciples drew near to Jesus said to him, Who do you think is great in the kingdom of heaven? He called a small lad and placed him in the midst. He said, I say, if you do not turn to become like this lad, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. He who receives a lad like this in my name receives me. He who causes one of the small lads, now it's in the plural, causes one of the small lads, the little ones, who believe on me to stumble, it'd be good for him to tie a millstone upon his neck and be cast into the depth of the sea, the one that causes the fall. The little ones were the apostles. They were also the 70. And one of those little ones did stumble.
Judas Iscariot. And the one that caused him to stumble, it was better that a millstone be tied at his, at his neck. He'd be thrown to the depth of the sea. And we know it was the high priest that did it. Didn't think about it like that, did you? Neither did I. Woe to the inhabitants of the world because of confusion, because confusion must come. He also said, woe to the man who comes because of it. It's all talking about Judas. And it's talking about the high priest that caused him to err and go astray. That's why he says, if your hand or your foot were to, were to cause you to stumble, cut it off. He's talking about Judas. In other words, whatever it takes to keep you from doing it, you should have done it. See, see, if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, he took with his feet and he walked there. He went to them to betray Jesus. His hand, because he held out his hand for the money. If your eyes should cause you to stumble, pluck it out, cast it from you. Take heed lest you judge one of the small lads. I say to you that their angels always see the sons of my Father who is heaven. Even that statement itself, verse 10, let's look at it in the King James, right? Verse 10. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. You see, don't despise, in this case here, and re, I mean it blows me away to even think this, don't despise what Judas did. Had he not done it, salvation could have not come. The Messiah would have not been handed over. There would be no sacrifice for our sins. There would be no outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Someone had to do it. And the thing is, it had to be someone that would represent righteousness. Because just as the priest of Israel had to offer up the sacrifices for sin, they had to do the bloody work. It wasn't a pretty sight what they did when they would offer these animals up, innocent little creatures that never did anything wrong. You could not have an unjust person go and offer Christ up. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. It literally makes me think completely differently about the story. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. That's why he's telling you don't despise, don't despise what he's going to do because how do you bring salvation if you don't have a sacrifice? We read as well, what is it, um, I think it's in the Gospel of John, or even in, even in Matthew here, let's see here. And it came to pass the time of the evening, he was sitting at the table with his twelve disciples, and they were eating, and he said to them, I say to you that one of you will inform against me. They were very sad and spoke each one of him, saying, Lord, is it I? He answered them, he who dips his hand with me in the dish will sell me. All of them were eating from one dish. Therefore, they did not recognize him because they had not recognized him. They would have destroyed him. They would have destroyed him. Now, does it make sense why he says over here, Take heed lest you judge one of the small lads. I say to you, their angels always see the sons of my Father who is in heaven. See, it couldn't be stopped. It had to happen. But I never realized that this was written right here in the book of Matthew chapter 18. The little lad is Judas.
Jesus said to them, Truly the Son of Man goes as it is written concerning of him. Woe to that man for whose sake the Son of Man is betrayed. Good would it be that that man not have been born. Judas has sold him, answered and said to him, Rabbi, am I this one? He said, You have spoken. They were eating and Jesus took bread, blessed and divided it and gave to his disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body. He took the cup, praised this to his father, gave it to them and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which I will be poured out for many for the atonement of sins. It had to happen. We know that. But we never probably realized that the lad that he set in the midst of them when they were wondering who was going to be the greatest was actually typing out Judas. But now it probably makes a lot more sense about cutting off your hand and your foot when you got a little kid there. It would have been better, in other words, what he is saying, had Judas cut off his foot so he couldn't even go and betray him. It would have been better if he cut off his hand so he didn't reach out and take that 30 pieces of silver. And of course, we know the ending of the story. Judas does repent. Judas does realize he shed innocent blood. Right? Let's see. Where is that at here? I think it's in Matthew 27. And when he had done that, I think it was before they crucify him, you know, he goes and, his, and he hangs himself as a result. He took the money back, throws it to the priest. He tries to, 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 to get this off of himself. And I've often wondered about that. How does that, how does that play out? I don't know. I know that the scripture calls him the son of perdition. Um, so it's, it's very, very troubling, but yet at the same time, it brings a whole new light to Matthew chapter 18 and the little lad. And of course, the one that caused him to stumble, he's the one that really brought judgment upon himself. I'm Stephen Benoon. I hope this blesses you in some strange way, I guess you could say. And uh, we hope to see you tonight on our Zoom meeting at 9 p.m. Eastern. Those of you that are interested in LifeWave X39, God bless you.